This episode is brought to you by Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much by going to airbnb.co.uk forward slash host. Clarence, yes. set in 33 AD That's Jerusalem. It. So like, you know what's happening, guys. Every, you know, everyone knows what happens in 33 everyone's, AD. Everyone's, it's all knocking around. Like, this is it. <laughs> this is the time when... Yeah. If you know, if that's, you know, that's all happening. The world's biggest influencer <laughs> is walking around. The PewDiePie of that time. <laughs> Don't feel like PewDiePie is the biggest YouTuber. Hey guys, just dropped another miracle. Yeah. Uh, today Mr. I'm going to I'm going to turn water into wine. <laughs> And I'm gonna give hundred thousand dollars. Here's how I fed five thousand people in one day <laughs> with just bread and fish. Watch me walk on water. <laughs> Craig and Clive are very much. I talk. Teeth. I talk in an English accent. Talk through my teeth. M. I'm very annoyed. God. Yeah. Why wasn't she on that transport? It's Clive Owen more. And then Daniel, yeah. Daniel Craig moves a bit more. When he gets very Ray upset, he sort of... Upset. Mm. Trying to do Ray Fiennes there a little bit, actually, as well. Well, Why do you tell that to Felix Leiter? We don't need the man behind the gun. We don't need the man behind the... It's got yeah. the theatrical little wind. Yeah, it always a little bit... We don't paperwork. need the man behind the gun. <laughs> He's, his his M is just had to. He's always just done a very stressful email. <laughs> yeah. Could you remind me again who you are? Money Penny. Double O seven. He sort of floats over the words. Trippingly. <laughs> That's a great Ian McKellen. He, he sort, sort of floats, floats over, over the words <laughs> and down the escalator and back for Bond in series two. You could be Patrick Stewart there as well, really. Yeah, they very similar. It. They're mates. They are mate. They're best. They're BFFs. Yeah. You know they've had fun, like, round the back of the Shakespeare's Globe, just g giggling. Oh, yeah. Oh, you, yeah, yeah. You looked at me like... <laughs> I was more just like, the Shakespeare's Globe. You know, they have, yeah. You know, like, they've giggled backstage oh, yeah, and had, had a laugh. Had a gig, and one of them's probably pants the other one. Yeah. Oh, Charles, you are a cad. Yeah. Charles, I mean... There's a really great, uh, in the extensive behind the scenes of The Hobbit, Ian McKellen and Hugo Weaving are provide... Because you know how they're a different size to the dwarfs on yes. set? So when the dwarves are doing their scene, they've got large stand-ins and so forth yeah. so hugo weaving and ian mckellen are off stage with a mic delivering the other half of the lines for yeah. the close-up of the dwarfs and they're both like real thespians who wants like when given a mic will just run with anything yeah, yeah. and like hugo weaving in this in this like piece of camera it's like well of course i love working with ian mckellen because he's a fellow thespian and he's just gorgeous and I just, any chance to work with ian is yeah. great and it was well working with hugo weaving is very much you know part of, he's one of me he's a thespian and they both just there giggling doing these lines but not taking them seriously yeah. passing the mic do you really think we can do this and then like as as Elrond Hugo Weaving is like you must come on the last day of Durin it's very funny they're having a good time I'm so sorry why well, I, I didn't I didn't you had nothing to say no <laughs> I was just like well yeah I, I, as I, always I smiled I smiled I've said many times on the show the best thing to come out of the Hobbit trilogy is the like 20 plus hour documentary that was made as part of the blu-ray oh, yeah. special feature you can find them all on YouTube but so good yeah. better bet more enjoyable than the films just to see how they made them incredible yeah and if you love sets studios filmmaking how like a huge you know 300 million dollar film gets made in new zealand it's the most comprehensive coverage of that whole process it's brilliant and how they were just winging it for like the whole yeah. first half of that movie and what eventually uh, well, you get a really good understanding over why those films look the way they do for better or worse it's brilliant though. would you like to have a documentary of other major yeah like, would you like to have seen a documentary about them planning the the new star wars trilogy and seeing all the turns oh, they shouldn't they have taken oh, just be where brilliant. kennedy's like you know what i think we should let a different director do each film i'd kill to be in the meeting after last jedi has come out oh. and it's been received in the way it had oh. And then they go, what? And then, you know, the directors are dropping out and they go, what are we going to do? I would have mm. killed to have just they, seen that. They're the already in production of, of Rise of Skywalker or whatever, or untitled episode nine yeah. by that point. Just going, what are we going to do? Who have we got? What mm. can we. JJ, can you. Well. How about a briefcase full of money? Which yeah. they get out of a mini fridge. They just not to have seen them with their heads in their hands being like, yeah. how do we do this? Or whether or not they were, when Ryan Johnson came to them with the Last Jedi concept, were they skeptical of it? Did they just have faith? Mm. Or was... Because they must have known that, well, if you write it that way, you've pigeonholed us slightly. Or that, did someone they, has to be across yeah, that. Maybe they were. Maybe Ryan Johnson knocked on the door of Kathleen Kennedy. It's Kathleen Kennedy, isn't it? Yeah. 
I get yeah. Kathleen Kennedy and Barbara yeah. Broccoli confused because the, the double barreled <laughs> franchise held us. Um, knocked on the door of uh, Kathleen Kerry Kennedy's Carrie Cauliflower's uh, Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Open up the door and they're just in there just counting. You know, like in like a, a mob film where they've got all the counters and the cigars and they're counting yeah, all the, the cash. <laughs> the, all the cash from the Force Awakens because they're, they're like, yeah. And Ryan Johnson's like, oh, I just, I got the script for yeah. uh, Last Jedi. Luke Skywalker. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just want to say that in the final fight, Luke yeah. Skywalker won't actually be there. So nothing he does yeah. actually matters. So good, so good. Brrr, that's it. Yeah. She's got a tattoo. She's got a tattoo of the gross <laughs> earnings <laughs> of Force Awakens. Yeah, that sounds great, Ryan. Just Put it in. BB-8 billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Who was that? Who was that? Yeah. And then that's it. Wow. Well, since we're two atrocious stories of oh uh, cinema mishaps oh God. Uh, from from my experience in cinema this week, so we'll start with we'll start with when I went to go and see Civil War. Civil War, big big uh, big multiplex, mm-hmm. uh, very busy. For, it was a Friday night, but even still, I'd count it as a, a fairly full screening. With people expecting a war film, would you say? I, it, I'll get onto this, right. but I really felt like the crowd. It's really hard to say just because I'm getting yeah. a feeling of a crowd. I really felt like they had come to see a war film yeah. and Civil War is, is obviously not that. But anyway, so fairly chatty. Um, again, I'll get onto this in my review and I think you had a similar experience, but I don't feel like the film had the audience yeah. and was really like locked them in so I can feel the restlessness and the rustling. Anyway, a couple who happened to be sitting next to me and Talia came in 25 minutes late for the film. Right. That's... So that means they are, what, 45, 50 minutes late from the actual program start yeah. time. So seriously late. Yeah. They come in, very noisy. Oh, sit down. I'll sit. Yeah, yeah, well, this, blah, blah, blah. Sit down. And then 25 minutes late to the film, they go, all right, should we go get some food? And then they get up to go get snacks. So now that's another what? five minutes. They're now 30 minutes late for the film, which is so distracting because they come back down with nachos, oh, big, God. big sodas, popcorn, like all just, you know, easily dropped 35 quid at the few thing. And I'm just thinking, you have no idea who these characters are, yeah. what they're doing, where they're going, yeah. who is what to who, who's related to who. You don't know what war is going on. Yeah. You are so clueless as to anything going on with this film. And that was so profoundly distracting. Did, did they think, I mean, did they then sit and watch the film? Well, I was, when they, when someone tells it like that, I'm thinking, do they think they're watching the trailers right now? They were terribly hit, talking the whole time. Oh. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, a lot of the moment, I'm going to get onto this in my review. You know, a lot of the moments in Civil War are music is stopped to show a photograph. Yes. Or sometimes a real moment of action in a scene is hard cut with yeah. silence. It's like a very common, you know, sort of action and yeah. the brutality of war. And then we cut to something serene. Yeah. When, Every time that happens, you would go, why are they doing that? Why, why are they? They shouldn't have done that. That's a silly thing to do. Which They lot, said that. You said that aloud. Out, out loud. Out loud, which I was kind of thinking sometimes, but I was like, you are, yeah. please shut the fuck up. Yeah. Please, please shut but, up. No, don't. So, so last week we talked about in an email how you're quite good at sometimes correcting people, but, but what, did, you, so, did you do anything with them? Did you what, engage? Well, so, so they were to my left. Right, so you got, you got Talia on my left once, and then it's those two. Oh, so they so, so they got buffer. So I did the I did the sort of elongated <laughs> Look, like like yeah. you're gonna see me, and the, I did I did wait for eye contact. They didn't get a talking to because it was almost like hard to call the strikes yeah. in my process. They actually sort of found a loophole in a way. They were already so late. I'm I'm uh, actually distracted by how much they've missed. It's it's like they clearly. Because they are so far removed from valuing this experience, you can't you can't re- re- um, you can't uh, rationalize with someone. Yeah, I also don't think English was their first language, oh, based right. on how they how they sounded. So I, I was just like, what can you do? So the ba- language barrier. Yeah, mm. and then uh, in my not Amy back to black screening. Right, similarly very weird. Uh, this was in a smaller cousin yeah. screening, like only three rows of seats and sort of like you know fifteen seats wide, yeah. and they were sort of down to the right. And you know, I saw it in Camden. The film is set in Camden and there's lots of shots of Camden where all of us likely in the screening yeah. live and had to literally walk past to get into the screening yeah. but every time it was like Camden Road blah 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 this it was pointing and talking pointing and talk- uh. yeah that's the place where it's imaging that's the thing with imaging uh. like just talky 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 and I was like yes it's Camden yes. you noticed it well done it wants you to know it's Camden yeah. it's not a secret that it's Camden anyway and then there's a, this isn't a spoiler, but in the film, um, a- Amy's uh, grandmother is diagnosed with lung cancer in, uh, sort of early on in the film. And it's sort of like a real sort of in- dramatic intention yeah. for, for Amy Winehouse in this film. And when that moment 
is said, the girl in the couple just bursts into tears hysterically. And so I'm just thinking, I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? And I'm like, okay, so I'm imagining you probably lost someone to, to lung cancer or yeah. just cancer and it's had an immediate profound effect yeah. on you, which I understand, but I'm also like, it's a film, it's not your life. Yeah. It, we can see Absolute things, that, horrible things that happen to people and sort of yeah. not necessarily meet the truth. And then the bot man like grabbed her and was comforting her and it was this whole episode in the middle of the film. And, and then they just, that scene ended, she was fine. They just continued talking. They talked the whole time. Oh. And I was, I think if the film had been better or more relevant to me as an audience member i would have probably gone and said something but i was almost yeah. we, when they were sort of on strike four and a half we were sort of maybe 20 minutes left in the film and yeah. i was like at this stage i think no point. yeah sometimes yeah it's like it, and sympathies i don't i don't know if this woman's tragically just lost someone to lung cancer i don't, I don't, know. I don't know but i'm almost like it was immediate wow. amy i have lung cancer <gasps> Like like a poll analogy, like hay fever. Like she just suddenly smelt lung cancer. The yeah. Big, I, 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 this I, I, I might sound quite insensitive, but just well, it, they, they were also talking the whole time. Oh, Regent's Park. Oh, Camden Chiefs. Oh yeah, that that's the bar next to Hashit. Yeah, yeah. And they needed too. a giant dose to shut the fuck up. Frankly, totally. uh, I, that is really that, that is reasons. That's sometimes why I get anxious going to the cinema and it's sort of a very low level. Because mm. I'm thinking, oh, and actually that's why I prefer going to the cinema on my own. Because if I go with, if I go on my own, I'm like, okay, I can manage this in my own way. I'll either talk to them, I'll either move yeah. or whatever. But if I go with someone, then I feel kind of like bound, yeah. either obligated to not say something so, so I don't embarrass the person I'm with or... Oh, that's so, so, so irritating. I knew last week we just went on a whole sort of like yeah. uncool diatribe about what we do to people in the cinema, but it was just, just terrible offences. But that, that uh, we've spoken before about the coming in late and oh. that being distracting for you because all you're thinking is like, you've just missed it. Yeah. I'm like reset my brain and I'm thinking, what do they deduce from this having yeah. only heard this scene? 25 minutes And then to in. go out and then come back in. But I'm like, that what annoys me is like, what you? why are you, you're wasting your time, That's you're like wasting your money. 15 minutes left to trade it, yeah. The, and they'll probably be like, oh, was it very good? Yeah, that's my, yeah. The, the, the tickets won't be cheap. The food won't be cheap. Five minutes happens. We understand. Yeah. That can happen when like sometimes you only get seven minutes of ads, not yeah. 25. Yeah, we, we've talked about this on the show. It can really sort of throw you. And, you know, I still think you can comment on a film after missing the first five minutes, frustrating as it is. Yeah. But 25 minutes? Oh, I mean, forget it. Forget it. What's the point? Go home, rip up your tickets. I just think it's so, it's just so uh, un, ungrateful and kind of arrogant. Ugh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Annoying. Welcome anyway. to episode 124 of Pulp Kitchen. Yeah, As really. you've deduced from this, we'll be talking about Back to Black, the Amy Winehouse film this week. And last week we reviewed Civil War, mm, which James just mentioned. George's review. And Ripley, the fantastic oh, so series good, on Netflix it? at the moment. Um, Do you know, I, I miss Ripley. Yeah, the movie. I miss um, watching that Ripley. Series, yeah. It was that good. I'm, 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 I'm like, am I going in again? I'm like, no. I'm, I'm loving, I mean, that sweet spot where I'm watching it slowly because I'm waiting for Anna to be around to watch it with yeah. her. And I always want to watch one more, but I'm also saving it because I know it's like a limited yeah. series. Oh, I, I binged it. Yeah. I had them flow. Well, you could watch it again. You could do, could I you? I would, I would. Yeah. It might be sooner than I think. I was watching it and I'm like, maybe I'll take black and white photography. Yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah. I'll start dressing like the '60s. Would you um? Would you get into film? Would you get into film photography? Film photography, because Civil sure. War also uh, photography. A photographer's film but was that shot on film? Civil no, no, no. War? The Civil War oh. is a photographer's film. Yes, and yeah. absolutely. Would I get into film photography yes. as opposed to the digital photography? Yes. Uh, yeah, all in good time. Just with yeah. with time and stuff. At the moment, though, like photography for me is a hobby. Mm. Uh, see both of our Instagrams for photography that we do, but I would the time that I have allocated to at the moment is yeah. sufficient for digital film would be another thing. But yeah, who's to say in due course? I'd love yeah. to, I'd love yeah. to. Um, James has seen Civil War now and mm -hmm. he's going to talk about it. We're both going to talk about it in spoiler terms and the bonus yeah. this week. Uh, we'll also be talking about the Joker 2 trailer, which came Folia out. De. Just give us sort of two words, Steve Coogan. That's what I'm saying, mm. right? We'll talk about that in the yeah. bonus episode. Steve Coogan. Um, but this week we've got uh, the two B films, uh, Back to Black and Book of Clarence which was kind of a film that was getting a lot of traction, a lot of talk about around like the festival circuit late last year, and then kind of disappeared from the conversation and is now coming out later this month, uh, which is sort of biblical. <laughs> it's so film. easy to deduce what you thought about this film from the way you enter it. And um, that film is that Hey, <laughs> hey, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for uh, that coming up. We've also got, we'll also do your emails as ever, guys. Yeah. And I have two 
new games for James to play at the end of this episode. So stick around for that. Should we get on with the show? Let's do it. Yay. Oh, George, oh, actually, you, wait. Uh, yeah, I've you've given, given up, up on, on chips. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually. <laughs> well, I'm two things. I'm that That's so funny. The same time. No, no, no. Okay. Perhaps Not two weeks ago. <laughs> hang on. I really need some water. <laughs> two weeks ago, George mentioned something, and I was like, I can't even process this, but you should save this for chit chat at the beginning of the show. And then we forgot to Look. do it two weeks in a row. Chips. Hold on. We like, we, we, we like a lot of time when we go out to eat. We'll go for a burger. Totally. Right. And who doesn't love fries? Great. You have the plain fries, you have the gravy fries, you have the Cajun fries, all the stuff, all the fries. Lovely. And I like chips, fish and chips. Who doesn't? But I'm starting to realize that I don't need the chips. I don't need the fries. That's that's mad. They don't, I would, I'd rather have two burgers than a burger and fries. So one time recently I had a five guys as a treat. Do you know what I did? I ordered burger, no fries, grilled cheese. Yeah. Because I'd rather have that. And there's something about the I've, fries. I've often got two burgers I, and a fries at Five Guys. Have you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Dishy. The yeah. two double burgers. Yeah. You, As we have established, you can put it. We both can. Oh, but you can, you can put it away yeah. at the moment. Like I 20, love to see it. It's like 26 quid as well. Yeah, <laughs> I'll like, get a regular you? Cajun fries, which is like shit loads. It's like a pile of fries. Yeah, because they, they just throw it in. And I'll get two burgers. And Good. That's four yeah. patties. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's anyway. A, it's a part of it. Anyway. <laughs> but um, I just think that... I often find when I go for a burger, I love the burger. I mm. eat that first and I savor it. And then the chips are kind of just like there as fodder. And I'm just oh, thinking- that's, that's just rubbish. They're, no, they're salty and they're I, crunchy you to contrast the burger. The, but the burger, I feel satisfied in my stomach. Whereas the, the chips are kind of like, yeah, these are- these So are. my friend Alex really winds me up because he, he likes burgers and he will do this thing where he will eat one and then the other. So he'll eat his burger yeah. in entirety and not touch his chips. That's what I've started to do. It really annoys yeah. you. I'm like, just Why you're meant. You? I don't know. They're, they're, to me, they're like meant to like complement each yeah, other. Maybe. The salty, crispy matchstick fry that, for me that cuts I'll, through like the the umami and the creamy, cheesy burgery. I want the burger. Yes. I love that burger hot as it. Can you're a sandwich be. guy. You do like a sandwich. Well, what's not to like? I mean, oh, really, no, it's, anyway, it's one of the greatest. Uh, you, you you have an appreciation for a sandwich, a bagel, uh, a bagel, a pastrami on rye. The world over, you know, the Americans have their sandwiches, the yeah. Italians have their sandwiches, the French, all of pa- pan Europe, pan world, really. You've got to go to Katz's next time you're in New York. I will you've do. Got to, it's definitely. like twenty eight dollars for the pastrami and rye, but you'll be absolutely fine. It's, it's big. Did I tell you that the bagel place I went to when I went to New, New York, which I only found because it was around the corner? Yeah. I then saw on TikTok loads of times as being recommended. This bagel place, yeah, yeah. And I, I was like, but I've actually been there organically. West yeah. Bagel, uh, best bagel is called in West Thirty Fifth Street. If anyone's there, West and West. The best in West, that's right. The other thing I just wanted to say was um, that's, I mean, comment if people feel differently about that. I just think that I- Yeah, burgers and fries. Like I could could live without them. It's nice to have them, but it's like the supporting character to the main meal. Because there've been warning signs where we've gone for a burger, you and me, and you go to me, should we share fries? Mm. And I'm a bit like- I think it's no. I think it's no. It's I want James my own fries. Share food, yeah, yeah. I'm sort of like no. I think I want my whole fries experience. So it's sort of, I, I, I've been you've, thinking, you've been worried. I've been, you've been worried. worried for a long time. I've been lying awake at night. And Tally goes, James, are you okay? I go, I don't know. Just something's George wrong. George wants some of my Something's fries. wrong with George. I know. <laughs> uh, that was that. Let us know what you think. The other thing I want to say: huge gear change here. You're gonna laugh at mm. the gear change. OJ Simpson died last week. <laughs> Um, and it's just a reminder uh, to everyone to watch the fantastic OJ Made in America, which was a documentary. I need to watch that. Yeah, uh, a fantastic documentary that won an Oscar and uh, I think won an Oscar and an Emmy. It kind of slipped through the categories nice. and be able to be doing both. Just, there are so many beats and twists in the OJ Simpson story from mm. the, from his early life as a sportsman through the trial and his life afterwards. That is just crazy. When 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 you know he died and the obituary was coming on, I was like, yeah, my God, the OJ Simpson story is Where so intoxicating. Where do you begin? There's so many bizarre, fascinating. It's it's it, it's one of those stories that you can't believe it's real. So yeah. OJ Made in America, the Ezra Edelman People vs. OJ as well on Netflix is also That's also a drama. wonderfully camp, uh, yeah. wiggy, deliciously entertaining yeah. uh, series, absolutely. But that was that, because he's dead now. That happened just before we were born. Uh, happened the summer of, I think actually yeah. the- Oh, so maybe you were just I've, being born. Yeah, the I summer's- two months I, I think out. the Bronco chase was like uh, two days after I was born or something. Interesting. Mm, July 94. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Let's go on with the show. Hey guys, this is a quick message brought to you in partnership with our friends at Airbnb. 
So George, I just got back from a nine day trip the other day. Yeah, you do go away a lot. Sorry, I do know it uh, kind of derails production slightly, but um, work or otherwise, I do enjoy getting a bit of winter sun. Mm. I do enjoy getting out of the sort of dark, wintry London months. Yes. And I will be going away again in a oh, few weeks but okay. with my family. But, um, you know, I was actually speaking to my older sister about this. And for the last two years, she hosts her flat on Airbnb every time she goes away. Okay. And it got me thinking, like, why don't I do this? It seems like a really easy thing to do. I actually went to go and check what other flats in my area were going for. And I realized my home was actually worth more than I thought. This just feels like a no-brainer. So if you were to go away now, you could host your flat on Airbnb. And when you come back, you made a little bit of extra pocket money. Yeah, to goes towards the next holiday. Yeah, smart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, I've never, I've never hosted on Airbnb, but I have stayed in an Airbnb several yeah. times. And uh, there have been a few times where I'm thinking, the host is the same age yeah. as me. Why am I not doing what they're doing? We should be doing we this. We should be doing this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just feels like something that would really fit into my lifestyle. Mm. But you guys could find out how much your home is worth by going to airbnb.co.uk forward slash host. So, George, the Book of Clarence, yes. I actually quite enjoy. So we went to go see a little screener for it. We went to the Sony offices. Yeah, really nice. It was quite cool, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, really cool. New new building, yeah. very, lots of natural light, little yeah. like, like stairs in the middle of the... Uh... Great views of London. There's yeah. no other sort of... The only tall right buildings in that Clinton. area are office buildings. So if you get into those and you get the view, you're getting mm. kind of a privileged And access. a very nice uh, screening room, almost like in Gorgeous. the centre of the floor. Like I said, As you'd expect from walk a up. purpose-built screening room for Sony's offices. Comfy seats. Yeah, lovely. Uh, Book of Clarence, directed by James Samuel, with James spelled J-E-Y-M-E-S. Yes. Yeah, it kind of sort of twitched my eye a bit, but, you know... That's how it is. That's how he rolls. That's how it is. Uh, who directed The Harder They Fall with... Um, Idris Elba. And... Uh, cancelled now. Jonathan Majors. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Which I haven't seen. Which I knew was like a Western, but it's like a uh, black exploitation Western. Right. Okay. And that makes you sense. Know, really kind of uh, uh, upending the genre. Yeah. Starring Lakeith Stanfield as Clarence, yes. set in 33 AD That's Jerusalem. It. So, like, you know what's happening, guys. Every, you know, everyone knows what happens in 33 AD. It's all knocking around. Like, this is it. <laughs> this is the time when. Yeah. If you know, if that's, you know, that's all happening. The world's biggest influencer <laughs> is walking around. <laughs> the PewDiePie of that time. <laughs> that PewDiePie's the biggest YouTuber. Hey guys, just dropped another miracle. Yeah. Uh, today Mr. I'm going to be showing you. I'm going to turn water into wine. <laughs> and I'm going to give $100,000. Here's how I fed 5,000 people in one day <laughs> with just bread and fish. Watch me walk on water. <laughs> Oh, oh. You thumbnails. Clans. Jesus yeah. debunked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the really like Why the Romans skin. hate Jesus. <laughs> Next up, Jesus is going to fight KSI. I'm going to be crucified for three whole days and come back to life. He's Set. David Blaine. <laughs> yeah. He's I'm going to get crucified and then yeah. I'm going to come back to life. Houdini once did a crucifixion. And as a kid, I couldn't stop watching it. Uh, anyway. ah, okay, so this is a, uh, a sort of satirical religious epic that I don't think is very religious. No. You know? Uh, it's like, oh, really? Well, it, it okay. does a bit. It's like, it's like a religious epic that isn't overtly yes. religious in, in the beginning. It's has a sort of um, modern day urban inflection to old school Bible verse yes. dialogue. And those Again, two are kind of mashed together. Upending the genre, isn't it? Kind of refreshing take. On yes, that. like you've got uh, Clarence and his good friend Elijah who are both sort of like drug dealer, weed smokers, but in a biblical setting, mm. sort of like, you know, chancing everything, running around. So you sort of see the yeah. modern day inflection in that. Uh, Clarence, uh, lots of plot stuff goes on in the beginning, but he he essentially is a mm. is someone who's is not very wealthy. He's down his luck, and he decides to pose as a new messiah to make money to pay off his debts. As an atheist, he is convinced that Jesus is out there performing miracles to get attention and to earn money. And he says, "Well, you know what." Considering all this stuff is nonsense, I bet I can do the yeah. same. Little does he know, Jesus is Jesus, and he's actually, you know, doing some legit yeah. Jesus stuff. Um, <laughs> he's doing all the Je all the Jesus stuff you've yeah, heard. Yeah, this of. isn't this isn't a film that questions. This is a film that believes in Jesus it, as, yeah. as having as being Jesus. Jesus and G Jesus not is in there in multiple forms, hanging yeah. around. Um, and he goes, well, look, if, if I can sort of comment on religion and go, I can probably pull the same tricks pull the same illusions it acts as sort of a parody of christian of christianity but also clarence on a journey of self-discovery yeah. in his way that he entwines himself with he christianity sick of being a nobody wants to be a somebody all that and that's basically the the main plot but there's there's a lot of 
elements and lots of different things and the sort of a road trip part of it, I think, and we're back yeah. and forth and yeah. travel. Um, so, yeah, do you want to start? Should I start? I guess I can start. Uh, yeah. Thank you, James, for the introduction. I mean, and we should also say that, you know, the film has kind of uh, got the kind of... the. The typography it uses oh, is like the classic 1950s classic, yes. biblical epic, The Book Moses of Moses and the Ten Commandments. Book one um, also stars uh, Omar Sy mm. with Benedict Sorry. Cumberbatch and James, James McAvoy. McAvoy yeah. Um, I Al- think, Alfred Woodard in there as yeah, well. Yeah, it's, it's a real good cast. It's re- uh, David Yellowo, really yes. kind of. It's a very stylish, very and it's a very kind of funny film that sorry, very stylish, very slick film mm. begins with kind of a, a, a chariot race. It's kind of very energetic. Ben Hur esque. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, I think James got more out of it than me. I'll, I'll be honest. Yeah. It's one of those viewing experiences where I really got nothing, <laughs> zilch, <laughs> zip out of it. And it's and, and not it's, it's not God. that I think it's a bad film. It just kind of went straight through me, and I just came away feeling nothing, and it slowly disappeared from my memory. Um, I will say that okay. If, you're making a film set in contemporary Jesus time, right? AD 33. And it's like, the big thing that hangs in the background of this is the life of Brian, okay? Yeah. Life of Brian, which is still incredibly funny, made 45 yeah. years ago, so one of the funniest comedies ever made, often tops the list of best comedies of all time. Yeah. I'm like, okay, that did that very well. Not to say you can't make a satirical biblical film set at the time of Jesus again in, in his cinema mm. history, but I think... The thing is, the film. This film is doing something very different, but I've never found the satire or the humor particularly cutting or f- mm. that funny. And I also think there's a point not too far in where you realize, like, oh, you're actually tr- wanting Going me to engage it. in this in this drama. You're pl- you're actually playing a lot of this straight. This is a, a serious drama that you want Which me to engage me by in. By surprise, considering the tone of yeah, the first two it acts. was so aloof, and I thought, oh, we're going for kind of a life of Brian Edge. It's not. It's much more actually building towards, particularly in its last. It's really serious, like things about spirituality and, and, and believing in yeah. religion, and I, I, I kind of all that stuff. I was like, mm, okay, so it's not as scabrous, funny, deep cutting as Life of Brian. Uh, it does try and aim for something a bit more sincere, which I don't think really lands. I love Lakeith Stanfield; I think he's great in this. Yeah, and, and actually, the direct the, the whole direction has real flair. It's just a bit baggy, a bit aimless, a bit sort of meandering. I. I, I sort of came away thinking, I'm just going to watch Life of Brian again. And yeah. I know that's terribly dismissive uh, of, of this film, but I, I, th- I could see what it's trying to do. I don't think it worked for me. There you go. Some good needle drops, though. First things I liked, before I sort of get into what didn't yeah. work for me, I liked the really tactile feel of the design of it. The costumes, mm. the locations. It's shot in that place in Italy that I think was No Time to Die also shot there. It's opening action <sighs> sequence. Yeah, it totally looked for me. It definitely it looked, looked like It looks really yeah. sort of biblical and old and there's wonderful like uh, houses of stone carved mm. into the mountains. It's beautiful. I thought, oh, this is really shot on location. We've got scenes with lots of extras. And I was like, oh, this is re-. You don't really see lots of films like that, especially no. for this sort of mid-tier budget. And I thought I really praised the way it looks. And, and I think the cinematography actually was, mm. was interesting. Absolutely. Um, I think the jokes for me did, didn't really get more than a slight chuckle at yeah. a couple of moments. A lot of it, I think we both found this feeling of, I was like, I've not checked my Bible in a while, yeah. my non-existent Bible. And I was like, I'm losing a lot of these references. And I think it's potentially for people who are much more Religious, attuned to yeah. Christianity. I'm like, yes, okay, so I know Judas. Yes. And that's, yeah. Ju- that's Jesus. Yes. And then, so Elijah was, yeah. and they remind me who the apostles were, and I'm a little and bit- And James l- McAvoy Pontius Pilate? Yes, I think he was, right. but I'm like, well, I couldn't tell you. I, I was doing the Old Testament as a kid. I wasn't checking this stuff. But anyway, I was just like, I kind of get the references, but am I missing a large part of the humor for having not yeah. had a little, uh, a little- Pracy for what's going on at this moment whilst it's in time. RE. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so th- 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 some of the jokes are lost in me. I think the use of the Romans as this, I think it's like, a, I want to say slightly half-assed attempt at representing white supremacy, given that they yeah. were all white and everyone else- A kind it, of police authority. Yeah. Police authority. I feel like it's a little bit of an underbaked attempt at something which yeah. could have been a lot more interesting. Yeah. My main criticism with it is that it tries to do far too many things yeah. on a very surface level. And the film I think is too long and I wish it had stuck and doubled down mm-hmm. on something much more specific yeah. using the parody of the story we all know and maybe not getting bogged down in so much detail for everyone who's not mm. so interested in it and said something a little bit more interesting so it's unfortunately a little bit unexplored it is too long when we start mm. with this uh 
book one, book two, book three. Oh. And when we got to the end of book one, I was like, God, was that just one of them? Yeah. There's probably going to be three. And I forgot about the whole book thing. And when we ended, when we entered book three, I thought, fuck, we got another, we go. another third to go. And I was a little bit uh, just ready, ready to go. Uh, ready. I, was done, I, I was done with my time with the film. I think the joke about the image of Jesus becoming what it was in our story yes. and who he was in this story, I think that is funny. And yes. it's, it's a very common joke to make about the depiction of Jesus yeah. Christ. And I, I did find that funny and it does sort of come to you at the very end. So I, I do think there is something smart about its interpretation yeah. of sort of about a, a Bible parody. Um, but then there's the, the dialogue style, I think, lets this film down from the, mm. from the beginning. And I think the film is slightly incomprehensible yes, for the reasons yeah. I've already said about us not necessarily getting all the references, but the Bible verse speech crossed with a modern urban inflection. It felt mm. like I was listening to two languages being spoken at the same time. Mm. My brain didn't quite know where to place it. So I struggled to connect to the characters. I struggled, struggled to understand what the intentions were for everyone. Mm. Despite I think it, the film's telling me, oh, this is funny, by the way. You're meant mm. to be laughing. And I'm, wait, I'm waiting to find it funny, but it just didn't quite come. So I, I feel like I was playing catch up for the dialogue mm. and I didn't quite get what I think I should have gotten out of it. But it, it does have charm. Yeah, it does. It is witty. It's made with skill and and clearly an, an idea that I think has just got lost on us a little bit. James has done a much better articulate job than I have on that, than this experience. Right, yeah. I will say there is an actor in it called Tom Vaughan Lawler, who is an Irish actor who plays the like one of the main centurions in it, who is deliciously cruel and evil. The blonde and a, one. No, no, the one who's like, this is my sword. I'll take you, centurion. You know, he's yeah, really- blonde. No, no, that's the young guy. Oh. That's the young guy. Oh, he, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, he's my daughter who's like, if I was to take my blade and cut it. He's just so yeah. like, ooh, theatrical and delicious. That's great. Yeah. I like, I liked that. But um, yeah, uh, a bit, mm. yeah. It's a shame. Uh, I, uh, we were just saying when we were making teas and coffees before we started, we've not, it's out this week, yeah. but we've not in our circle at least seen like social media trailers, bars, advertising, Yes, so uh, therefore I wonder, is it not being, are they not pushing it if it's not going to get sort of the I'm reception they think it will? I'm wondering if people are baffled by it. They show it to Don't people. To that's it. kind of actually how I feel. I felt just a little bit baffled, a bit bemused and just thought... Okay, well, there's some stuff there, but I don't get a lot of it, and uh, now I'm going to move on. And I think it's kind of leaving people cold. Yeah. So they probably don't know how to how much effort to throw behind Maybe it. Maybe our more religious listeners will get more out of yeah. it. Yeah. Sorry, uh, we're not. Right in. If there, there are any deep... Christians out there, you know, this is a broad church. Pulp Kitchen accepts people of all faith, <laughs> just to say, <laughs> yeah, you know, of course, like it goes without saying, yeah. but I just said it anyway. Um, but uh, if you are a, a I'm new, like, no, 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 George, you're a New Testament guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, no, we don't. <laughs> no, yeah. no, 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 let's, let's chat. <laughs> No, of course. Everyone welcome. Um, if you are, uh, you know, brushed up on this stuff and you had a deep well, reaction. It was a deep dive into it. Yeah. Into like the the, cool. the, thir like, the 30s AD. Yeah. The literal 30s. Yeah. <laughs> the first. The OG 30s. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, God, I haven't walked what around was, Nazareth what, for a uh, while. I'm being really, being really ignorant. What was 1 AD? What happened at the BC AD Change border? Changeover. Yeah. Christ was born. Oh, born. And then he, he, he so, died in 33. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, the, big, yeah, the big sort of changeover. They said, have you changed your watches? Because Christ has been born now. <laughs> yeah. I'm on BC what? time. We're just starting it all again. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> so then you add zero. I mean, obviously, this, is all, done in, this is all done in retrospect. Yeah, so yeah, you don't yeah, add no, it like, You yeah. imagine it being like the year two, and you're like, great, year two. God. I wonder if where we'll be in 2,000 years' time. Yeah. Anyway, uh, book, that, of Clarence. book of Clarence. As always, if you, if you guys had interesting thoughts or interesting opinions, uh, as always, send in your thoughts, your questions, your concerns to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. We'd love to hear what you guys thought of Book of Clarence if you go to see it. Moving on. So, I just don't think I should be wearing horizontal stripes on camera. Thin, like thin horizontal stripes, it's a no-no. You could put like a shirt over it. That's what you could do to break it up. Now that'd be shirt. continuity errors. I know. You could do it now, though, if you wanted. We've only got one, one, one review in. You could, you could do it on camera. I could see you put your shirt on if you want to. Just saying. I'm I don't want to. There you go. You probably need a shirt like this, <laughs> actually, to wear over it. Um, okay. You know what I like about that shirt? Uh, the torso is long. Yes, it is, actually. Which, in denim shirts I've previously not. owned, that... that it just don't yeah. have the torso. Like, I'm, I'm a man who's tall in his torso. I tell you this now, it does need breaking in. It's, it's stiff. De always denim. You've got yeah. to sort of... It's real. You know when you've washed a pair of jeans you've owned for years <gasps> and sometimes you've got to just do a little squat in them just to loosen the fibres? <gasps> and then you're yeah. good. And then do you you're know good. The, the irony is that like when my dad was 
teenager in the 70s, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd get your trousers and you'd, I think there's a scene in Quadrophenia like this, you, you, you bought your jeans, then you'd go sit in the bath with them on and then you'd go and, so they, so they shrunk on you ah. and you'd get out of the bath and you'd sit on a towel and you'd let them dry on you so they, they completely shrunk, yeah. The, it, the first time? Well, just just any uh, the, the skinny jeans, drainpipe jeans were a big thing in the seventies. Oh, uh, right. So you, yeah. So that's that's how that's how the kids those days would do that. Do you do that every time you go out, or just no, 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 just just like the, the first. Once. Oh yeah, not every time. Like, <laughs> yeah, John's here. <laughs> Bloody hell, do you dripping wet? <laughs> yeah, that's, but look how good I look. What a horrible experience to be out on the town in the seventies with soggy <laughs> jeans and dripping teenagers <laughs> yeah. everywhere. Someone's dancing on you. They're like, oh. <laughs> The <laughs> chafing. That's all I'm gonna say. Oh, t- Denim? Like that. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> what a horrible thing to say. When there's like when you, in your childhood, when for some reason you were running around in jeans and you accidentally like went in a lake and they got wet, and then you had the rest of like that afternoon until you got oh, home and your jeans were wet. That's why it's so unpleasant. School any school trips you went on, particularly the geography school trips, they were mm. like no denim. Yeah. Chinos. The the, z- the zipper. The the three quarters oh, zip. The cargo tra- the cargo trousers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're cool. Huh? Cargo trousers are cool now, George. Uh, that's what the kids say, but I don't. They are. Uh, I see the I'm kids with, with the Oakley's bucket hat. Oh, thank God! Oh, thank trousers. God you brought your cargo trousers. Thank yeah. God, because we, we needed your your pockets. <laughs> they're very things. trendy on sets now because they've got uh, because they're functional. Pockets yeah, okay, functional, that's yeah. that's fine. But, Carri- it, but buy clips. some sort of you know trust fund kid who's gone to Glastonbury and who's wearing it with his bucket hat. Yeah, I just wanted my cargo pants. I never wear like utilitarian clothes. I'm always like in some Reese chinos. <laughs> like you got all these things strapped We to cut legs. different shapes, James. That's <laughs> we why. Do. We do. Anyway, let's do... Um, it's back to black. Yes. Which we keep calling Wait, Amy, which is the Asif Sephardia doc. I'll get into that. Yeah. So, back to black, which is the new film about... Amy Winehouse. Amy Winehouse musical biopic. It seems we were destined to get one and here we've got one. Mm. So let's begin by talking about, you can't ignore the fact that nine years ago, Asif Kavadia made a really great documentary. I thought it was great. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Loved it. Called Amy, about Amy Winehouse's life. And Asif Kavadia, who, you know, made Senna and Maradona, great documentarian. And that film, that documentary really uh, looked at Amy's life in a very interesting way, drop a lot of uh, questions about the people in her life. Her uh, partner, Blake, came out like a real piece of work. And her father also came out particularly, uh, it, it was not a kind portrayal. Blake was never loved even at the time. No, uh, he was a real... There's that famous oh, God, moment yeah. where she's at Glastonbury and she's like, my husband's coming out of jail soon. Yeah. And everyone at Glastonbury's like, boo, he yeah. fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I remember at the time of the documentary that the father, Mitch, Mitch Whitehouse said, Winehouse, Mitch Winehouse said, <clears throat> I'm very unhappy with my portrayal in this. I've been pretty yeah. misrepresented. I'm thinking, well, well there's, there's some source, f- yeah, there's there's primary source footage yeah, of you uh, being an absolute slimeball. Actions speak louder than words, Mitch, but sure. Uh, j- sorry, just before you go on, I just want to caveat with like, w- you and I are probably likely to, to say in what we're about to say that we don't think some things this film said were true to her story. And obviously you have to caveat that with like, we've only been subject to what the media has given us and what a documentarian, granted though feeling accurate, has given us. So yeah. although we are obviously putting our own projection on what we assume yes. to be correct in the story, I'm just caveating with the fact that we're only subject yes. to what we've been given. And I'm only bringing up the documentary- But I do to- have the overwhelming feeling yes. feelings about- And I also, I'm bringing up the documentary just to contextualize the fact that this film is coming out to audiences, many of whom will have seen the documentary and yeah. been privy to that information. It's not coming out in a world where that documentary never happened. No. But nonetheless, now we have a studio, big studio musical biopic about her life with the um, uh, in inclusion and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Thumbs up from her family and her father to do so. Mm. And sure enough, her father, guess what? Comes off, comes off like a saint in this movie. It really is of mm. the Winehouse Foundation, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> TM. Yeah. Okay, so... Back to Black, Amy Winehouse, we pick up with her in the early noughties, um, where she's living in North London, has a deep connection with her nan, played by Leslie Manville, who herself is a 50s singer, and brings with her so much style and inherited iconography Mm. of that era, which Amy just falls in love with. Amy already has a powerful voice. Amy, by the way, played in this by relative newcomer Marissa Abella. People might know her from Industry, the TV show. She's incredibly talented, but even from an early age, has issues surrounding alcohol and smoking and addictive uh, 
It's not like an addictive personality. Yeah, thank you. Almost. Thank like you for the word I'm looking for. Thank yeah. you. He has a, you know, unfortunately addictive personality. Bad drunk as well. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and, and you know, an unhealthy relationship with drugs and substances. She quickly finds success and we see some sort of nice archive footage of her on Jonathan Ross show where they've put Marissa Abela in cut with the actual Jonathan yeah. Ross interview at the time. She's um, sort of looked over by her uh, dad, Mitch Whitehouse played by, Winehouse played by Eddie Marzan, the wonderful, wonderful Eddie, Eddie Marzan, Marzan, who we love in everything and who does a good, with his task in yeah. this film, which I guess is to humanize Mitch, he does a good job with that. And Eddie Marzan a lot more, I think I said this when we talked about Fair Play, he's a lot more versatile than people give him credit totally. for. He, if you actually look at his, his suite of work, he does many, many different things. Yes. But I think in my mind, I automatically think of him doing one thing. Yeah. He can do sinister, he can do sweet, he's, he can do yeah. intellectual, he can do stupid. He's really good at, 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 he's a real Swiss army knife of an actor. Oh, he's, he's one of the best, one yeah, of the best. He's really good. Um, and then soon enough, we meet... Blake, played by the wonderful Jack O'Connell as well, who I think oh, is just a terrific actor. I love every time I see him. Blake, who Amy quickly becomes deeply, deeply infatuated with, deeply, deeply in love with, who is a confident, Lothario, chatty, um, laddie. Charming. Charming, but also problematic, dr hard drug taking and um, difficult companion to Amy Winehouse. So the film kind of follows her twin parallel things of her success and her songs and how her life behind her music informed her music and you know events will happen in the film that then subsequently we'll hear the song about and we'll think oh well there you go i now know what you go back to her means i now know what you try to maybe go to rehab means but um, um i think it's, it's just worth before i hand over to you, james talking about what i think sam taylor johnson's intention was mm. and i think that you know no one goes into this because this film has been made, uh, sorry, this film has received a very, sort of very, very mixed, explosive emotional reaction from people. A lot of people are really hating on it. There's been some sort of excoriating one-star reviews. Mm. I don't think it's anything but as bad as that. No. I think it's clear that what Sam Taylor Johnson was trying to do, Sam Taylor Johnson, by the way, who made Nowhere Boy, the John Lennon movie, and uh, Fifty Shades, Fifty Shades of, Grey. of Grey. She... I understand is is trying to get us to understand the, the life from Amy's point of view. And although the media in our lifetime and you and I, well, that's what was great about that Asif Party documentary because yeah. you and I being product of our generation had a certain perception of Amy Winehouse and that kind of un unpacked it. I remember exactly where I was when I found out she died. Exactly. Yeah. And mo most people will do. Yeah. Um, where were you? I was in Israel. Oh yeah. Yeah. On a, like a Israel tour. I was working on, at a checkout at a supermarket mm. and my manager came over to approve the alcohol sale for someone because I was under 18 so I couldn't do that and right. she was on the phone and she was like yeah there you go yeah Amy Winehouse is dead <laughs> just walked <laughs> off <laughs> I was like oh my god <laughs> anyway um, but but um, what Sam Taylor Johnson I think is clearly trying to do is to say you know Amy loved Blake for better yeah. or for worse we should try to understand what she saw in him and what, and what she got out of it and what drove her music from her point of view and to her credit I think there is a sincere effort on Sam Taylor Johnson's part to create a space where we understand Amy in sort of like three dimensions and mm. there's scenes given to her. We really see her process of her writing music in, mm. in that respect. So that is the, the setup of Back to Black. Mm. James. So first of all, uh, we tried to go and see this the Friday it released in a Camden cinema. Sold out. Mm. Couldn't get a ticket. Obviously Camden, her home ground, her statue. We walked past it the other day. Yeah. Her statue sits in the stables market. One of the great British music exports, one of the great albums of all time in, yeah, in, in Back sort of. to Black. Yeah. Truly distinctive voice. I, I sort of, uh, I actually think Marissa Abel is really, re actually really solid in this, given the, I think a very impossible task yeah. of trying to capture a story of a person that we all think is distinctive and iconic, but also trying to sound like her without doing an impression. I, mm -hmm. I think all in all, she really does do her best with, with what she's given. Yeah. Um, and I think Amy Winehouse's voice is so unique. There's very few uh, female solo artists that sound like Amy Winehouse yeah. outside of like Etta James and a couple of old school jazz mm. jazz singers. Yeah, she had a voice from a different time. Totally, uh, just a whole demeanor from a different time. Um, so yeah, you've got the Asif Kapadi doc, which is very much in my, in my, in my head. And I'm very much want to caveat my opinions with saying, of course, I'm only thinking about what I know the Amy Winehouse mm -hmm. story to be true based on what media I've been given. Mm -hmm. That being said, as soon as I started watching this, I feel like this is Winehouse corporate branding. Yeah. It feels like it's from the Winehouse Foundation trying to paint a very sort of surface and sanitized mm. version of this story that doesn't really get to the heart of it. Mm. And so therefore, unfortunately, I don't think, because it doesn't show, I think, the true nature of 
addiction and doesn't, I think, critique, critique the people around mm. Amy's life enough and actually Amy mm. herself. Unfortunately, it yeah. offers very little to its audience mm. outside of playing some of the great songs from, from her album and sort of getting you to remind mm. yourself of where she's from and her come up story. So yeah. it offers very little because it doesn't show very little. For example, I found the whole process of depiction of rehab laughable. She went to rehab, sat by a tree, yes. wrote a song, and that was it. Yeah, you're right. I know. Are you that was, saying, that I thought that was crazily. just disrespectful yeah. to the whole process of rehab yeah. and like shining a light on what that would have been like for Amy Winehouse. Yeah. You've touched on the great Jack O'Connell, who I mm. think who I think is great playing um, playing Blake. And you know, Jack O'Connell's great, but it's almost depicted as charming. And mm. I know what you said about sort of trying to get Amy's yeah. perspective. Yeah, I, yeah I, that's the approach. I don't think it works. I don't, I don't I think, think that's the intention. Works because the rest of the film isn't necessarily from Amy's point of view. Yeah. So therefore I'm like, I don't really want to like this character. I remember mm. the, the, the documentary and oh, like, he's a real versions of it. He's a real sort of Pete Doherty wannabe yeah. slime ball. Um, and so I just never really got what I was meant to be doing with that character. But I don't think that's sort of the, the actor's fault. Um, the accent from like at times a little bit over overdone what from uh, uh, Marissa, Marissa Baylor like she so she's like a she's like a north london sort of slightly et, like essex jew yeah. uh, accent like, i think she's born in enfield so you get that sort of north north but over the essex yeah. way style but it's a little bit like i make music yeah and like if i'm not creating there's mm. moments and i think in the dialogue in the especially in the first third mm. i cringed a little bit but all in all there's great moments towards the end where she's singing up on stage and she's doing that live uh yeah. live connection with um with is it the what what, what it was is it? the it was the Grammys the Grammys and yeah, I think Tony she's really, she's really capturing her energy and her silhouette and I think I think Russell Bella does does what she can, um, but the ending for me in particular really showed really decided in my head how little they were willing to confront yes. the real story okay. and you know, there's no spoilers that Amy Winehouse died right the yep. Titanic sank it's more that I just thought you decided to tell this whole story then at the very end you just went. And she died. Yeah, I was like, she died of alcohol poisoning, and, and it, yes. which was. But she was fun. actually sober uh, for a while before. <laughs> yeah, she, which is very. Yeah, yeah. It just, I just thought it was such a sort of flat ending that made me go, "All right," mm. and it's done. But that's that's my main thoughts. On no, it, I, I, I basically I, I feel very similar to you. I, I found it to be honest, I found it quite dreary and dull. And I think the, the key thing is it's joyless. Amy Winehouse. <sighs> was such a laugh. She was such a character. Sorry, true, yeah. And you can, you know, show the tragedy in someone's life and someone's life afflicted by, you know, massive troubles, but also celebrate the kind of powerhouse personality that they were. Yeah. And there was a couple of times I just thought, where is the the joy in celebrating this character. I think what's happened is they're, they're going for sincerity so much. I think Sam Taylor Johnson is so keen to be shown to be being sincere and handling this with care she's forgotten the the actual flair that made Amy Winehouse Amy Winehouse because there's a couple of times I thought Amy Winehouse would hate this she would oh she would hate absolutely it absolutely hates and already you're dealing with the fact that it's a studio sanctioned big budget you yeah. know square movie and I just just thought it feels very uncharacteristic of Amy Winehouse as a personality and that that's a real shame. I think the script is terrible at times. Absolutely terrible. The dialogue first is, half I, I, I was found yeah the dialogue time. is particularly cringy. And I think what happens is that Marissa Abella, who does a good performance, don't get me wrong, absolutely does, and is that it's a very similar thing that happened when I saw Don't Worry Darling, which is that Florence oh, yeah. Pugh is doing great work in yeah. there, but because the film around her is so poor, it occasionally oh, yeah. makes her look like she's overacting and overacting. Yeah. And that's what's happening here. Marissa Bella is doing a good performance, but because the, sometimes the dialogue holds it back, it means that it, it draws so much attention to her performance and so much to her character. she's in every scene, really. She's in every scene. She lives and breathes the whole movie. Mm. So I think that's a real uh, disappointment. Um, I think the documentary is really important to mention because... It just did all the things that you'd want from this film, mm. but better. So the documentary made you excited for Amy Winehouse's success. It made you angry at the way that she was treated by the media and the paparazzi and the way she was treated by people in her life. But it also made you ultimately overwhelmed with sadness at her life cut short. Yeah. And I don't think this film did really any of those things to, to a great extent. You mentioned there the Tony Bennett Grammy win. And like that happens in this movie and it's kind of like, yeah, okay. But we know in the, in the documentary, that's a real key p point because we're told that Amy, t um, a friend ran up to Amy and was like, this is amazing. And she said something, and I, you know, I'm sort of para quoting here. She said something like, yeah, but it's just not the same without drugs. And that's mm. such a key moment 
in the trajectory of her yeah. life. And I, I, I agree. I think the film is, unafra- is, is afraid to really get its fingers dirty because it's doing this sort of corporate sanctioned movie. Mm. And I think that's, that's, that's sad. I think, I lost my train of thought now. I think the film is also afraid to draw a parallel in, in, in just, the whole film, like I said, it has you know the, the relationship, her personal relationship with Blake and her career success. I think the film is too afraid to draw a stronger line between the addiction to alcohol and substances and her addiction to Blake as a character. Like to draw a fact that that, that it's all part of one addictive personality, a self-destructive personality. That it, it's not this kind of sort of. A, it's a separate thing. And I just thought that was like, that's, you could have done more with that. And again, this, yeah, some of the depictions of alcoholism and drug taking is a little bit like heroin. I well, thought I guess really... I'll crack. It's crack. Okay. Oh, crack. Yeah. So. But I mean, splitting hairs, but yes, I know. It's sort of really like poorly used as a framing for Amy Winehouse's life. Mm. Just saying, I, I don't know what it meant. I just like, this really didn't feel like it got to the core of why that turned up in the first place and what, yeah. where it was in, in the background. I just, and I just pretty soon into it, I just got the whole sense of like, yeah, I, I, I think you've tried to make quite a sincere picture here, but I kept getting that feeling of this just doesn't feel like her. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel true to the story. I just don't think this is the way that you capture the scene this. when like her her music uh manager tries to tell her she needs to go to rehab oh, and right. Mitch yeah. Mitch Winehouse there. That's when the dialogue really felt like it had been noted over as to what what it happened. I, I, a lot just the whole thing of yeah I think she'll be all right. Yeah. My daddy says I'm okay. It was poor. There's also a, there's also a point in that where they're writing that scene and they're thinking okay we can't have this guy say i need you to go to rehab because it sounds too much like the song <laughs> right so the guy says really, he, he oh, goes is going to go no 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 he goes he goes amy you need to go to a rehabilitation center and it's like the screenwriter has highlighted the word rehab and clicked full like, expand or <laughs> synonymous i'm like no one says rehabilitation center in a no. sentence like that no, no, no human would say that you all say rehab and it's just moments like that that really pull you out of it um so it's, it's a shame there's not more to really celebrate in it other than the performances trying to do the best they can. The music is obviously great, but... You just feel like chunks of that story are missing, particularly to do with Mitch Winehouse. Yeah, yeah. And just like, That's like the, real the, 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 the scenes we know of like o- overly monetizing something yeah. to draw blood out of the stone. You just, unfortunately, I hope people aren't watching this. Maybe Americans who aren't familiar with Amy Winehouse, I don't know, are thinking that and going, ah, oh, Amy Winehouse, yeah. It doesn't critique Amy either. No, which, exactly. I'm not saying uh, the things that happened to Amy were her fault, but you almost want biopics to hold a really sort of honest mirror up to the people they're yeah. portraying and be like, well, what were their flaws? I feel like it doesn't actually ever acknowledge her flaws. And if she had addictions to alcohol yeah. and drugs, it was related to other things that had happened to her in the past and not like an assessment of her character at the time. And I think the way that, that Sam Taylor Johnson has been talking about this film in interviews, it's kind of like, come on, come off it. Like she says things like, well, you know, of course the media are the real enemy in this movie. And I'm like, they're not actually included that much in this. Yes, the paparazzi are there, and of course yeah. they're villainous. But like I said, the documentary makes you much more angry at the, the sort of, you know, parasitic relationship mm. that the press had on her. And... The, the when they, and she says you know I wanted to focus on this sort of beautiful love story I'm like it's not a beautiful love story no. he was a piece of shit he was awful he was a piece of shit and they were in a terrible if terrible you don't relationship know, Google Blake is it Harris I don't something know. just Google Google him and, and just think does that look like a nice boy you want to bring home and uh, and there's actually a bit that I can't necessarily talk about it because it's I guess it's a spoiler but the, the 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 last scene that we see between Blake and Amy the dialogue is like oh, we need to wrap up this scene now. By the way, I've decided that this, because of this, and I just, no, um, n- not not the, great. The, there's a really great moment in the Amy doc at that scene when she accepts the Grammy and they're announcing the nominees for best album and it's like Amy Winehouse back to black. And she's like, she's like her mic is yeah. live and it's Justin Timberlake's What Goes Around Comes Around. And Amy just goes, his album's called What Goes Around Comes Around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's such a funny moment because she's obviously never heard that album yeah, before, yeah. but looks at that title and her and Justin Timberlake obviously cut from very different yeah. cloths. But that's just, what I mean. Just ridiculing that title is so funny. She was funny. Great she album. had a great personality. She was, yeah. she, that's, that's what's missing. It kind of uh, painted with a very sort of dour brush. So dour, dreary, dull, joyless, joyless because celebration. Because it doesn't feel truthful or inaccurate. I, I don't think it offers very much. No, little though. Go watch the Asif Kapadi documentary. You'll get, you'll be much better served yeah. by, by that. And just go listen to her music. She's oh, great. Oh, great. We had it on before the show. Yeah. Yeah. 
It was great. Well, there you go, guys. That was our review of not Amy, Back to Black. Uh, just go and watch the documentary. But if you did watch Back to Black and you wanted to let us know your thoughts, please send them in, as always, to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. And we will read them out on the show. I actually made me think Back to Black. It made mm. me think that music biopics might be my least favourite genre mm. of a film. So in the past five to six years, we've had loads. Bohemian Rhapsody, Rocket Man, Elvis, Bob Marley, One Love, mm. now Back to Black. A David Bowie one that no one watched. Yeah, because they, they couldn't get the rights to it. Um, but the one with Johnny Flynn in uh, Set in America. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't get any. But I, I'm, I'm just like, this made me realise, I don't think, all of those films are kind of varying quality. Mm. I think Rocket Man probably might be the best because Taron Egerton does a great performance, sings yeah. his own songs. Also, that film is very open to deeply critiquing yeah. the character that Elton his John behavior is. And who he his behaviour, it was unacceptable. He was a difficult person, like, great. Um, it's, sorry, it's framed through him turning up at a rehab, group, rehab a group, session yeah, dressed exactly. like a thing. Yeah. That's right. Um, but I think on the whole, the problem I always have with these movies is that you take someone who's first, whose legacy is so big and they are so iconic, but especially with a mu- musician whose work is very you know, ephemeral and they are effervescent on screen and, and actually music can be so transcendental to then try and re- put that within the confines of a film. It's like putting a genie back in the lamp. Mm. It's really strange. I just don't think that, and that, that's, that's what I noticed with this, with the Amy Winehouse, that you take the, the, everything that Amy Winehouse represents, all about her character, <clears throat> and then you pull the flats up and try and make this into Present a movie. Into a thing, and I, yeah. just, I just don't think it works. And I don't think it's that interesting, unless that so person marketable. has a very specific event in their life that you want to, to, to highlight and, and focus it around. Or reveal through the course of storytelling that can otherwise have been told in a documentary or a news article. Yeah, but I think really it's that... It's like, I would think it would have been interesting to unpack the last moments of her life being leaving rehab, sobri- properly addressing sobriety, yeah. and then eventually what, what what happened in her death. Yeah, that to me is like the part that I think provides a lot of interest. Mm. In really getting into grips of who was this person and why why did they lose their life so early and what were the things mm. leading up to that moment. Yeah, I, I yeah I agree. But I I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I just don't think the genre that format no, really I, serves a, a great movie. You can't point at a handful of them and go, oh well, of course this one really does does service to it it's like you know even elvis despite the campiness of it it's because it's got the baz lerman flair i actually mm. think it it gets to sort of um sit above a lot of the yeah. other naughtiness that some of the other ones get bogged down into by being more fun and being more of a celebration yeah. of elvis's life but then like you go and watch priscilla and yeah you go, well, exactly. <laughs> and then you like, feel like elvis is incomplete by by watching priscilla when you when you watch that that's that's more interesting approach so uh, yeah whenever i see now big music studio biopics it's i feel very cynical i'm just like you're just trying to sell your your media conglomerate probably oh. owns the rights to the music yeah so you want to just oh, make the totally. movie so you can then sell more of there's, the music there's a reason these are all like the top 15 highest selling music artists of all time give or exactly. take that are and there's a michael jackson biopics. one coming out next year which i feel very and very conflicted of about. the Jackson Foundation. Oh, 100%, <laughs> yeah. which is why I feel so conflicted about yeah. it. Because still, um, I've seen a great Michael Jackson movie. It's called Leaving Neverland, and it's out there yeah. if you want to watch it, yeah. okay? Uh, it's weird, because on my TikTok the other day, I was getting clips of the end of the Michael Jackson West End musical. Right. And it's like, you know, when all the cast come out and they do their bow and they keep dancing, and all the crowd are going mad. I, I'm, I'm not to sort of take a huge stance to this, but I'm slightly confused as to why... Yeah. Some people have been horrifically cancelled, and Michael Jackson is just basically it drives me staved crazy. all of it off. Yeah. And if you've seen the Leaving Neverland documentary, which is a it's not a grey area documentary for me, it's oh, no. a very black and white yeah. four hour explanation of who this man was and the things that he did. Mm. I'm just slightly astounded that yeah. he's th- this is all still happening, and I, I really don't believe that that film is going to properly it's address. Not. I to- there's already articles being written about it. There was a Variety article that was like, okay, you're getting another big studio sanctioned biopic with, and it's got like. Like um, uh, Coleman Domingo's in it, Miles Teller, and they're like, "But how are you going to address the massive, massive, if if you politely put it, question mark over Michael Jackson's yeah. life in this movie?" And they'll go, "Oh, probably not." But it's they it, the movie's going to cost 150 million dollars to Fuck. make, but they know because he's one of the biggest selling artists all time, they'll probably make that back. And all of these musical biopics make money. Yeah, they, do they well. all do really well, so it's not going to stop. And I don't think that film is going to touch on that, if at all. If it does, not very well, but. I feel very conflicted about yeah. that movie. Stay tuned for uh, for that next year. More biopics. Mm. Yeah. Right. Love. 
Rob, Rob. Yeah, she was just my little girl, my little princess, Amy. Yeah, yeah. You turned up in the Maldives with the film crew when she was trying to get clean. You yeah. dickhead. <laughs> you know that moment when he like finds the crack pipe in her mug. Yeah. Firstly, why is crack pipe in the mug that's been washed up in the cupboard? Totally true. And also, her as an addict wouldn't say, "Maybe, oh yeah, go make me a cup of tea." She'd go, "No, no, 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 no! <laughs> My fucking crack oh, pipe's yeah. in there." <laughs> yeah. I just uh, and then him just like seeing it, pocketing it, and never doing anything, anything else with it. Oh, you're an addict. I've never. Yeah. So if that was crack, they never addressed heroin then. No. Did she take heroin? Yes. Was she big? Heroin? Yeah. Huh, see, because heroin is that's crack cocaine. You can smoke heroin. Oh, I thought it, I thought it was crack. <laughs> I thought it was a little gram of crack. Well, I think you can you can smoke heroin. It look, I know what you mean. It looked like a crack rock, but I it thought it was a crack heroin. pipe because that's a crack. You know, what? I'm going to type in crack pipe. As you can tell, we don't do heroin or crack, so the, the administration is. Yeah, it's crack. It was a bit like yeah, that. I know that's crack. a crack pipe, but I think you can do heroin in a crack pipe. Guys, if you do crack or heroin and you <laughs> <laughs> shed light on this, I think... I didn't know that was going on, by the way. Yeah, so. yeah, it's all in. I know what you mean, though. If you've seen it, I don't know if that was crack or heroin. I, I, but I, she did do it's heroin. It's been a while since I've done either. <laughs> either. Yeah. No, I've never. Your, your troubling days of 2014, you know, you were... Lockdown, mate. Yeah. Just thought, yeah. let's have a crack at the cack. <laughs> So whatever. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway, George, should we go through some of the emails that we get sent into the show every single week? As always, guys, if you had thoughts, questions, reviews, concerns, thoughts, send them in to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Musings. Musings. Uh, just like Ryan did, Ryan writes into the show, a friend of the show, and says, Hi, James and George. Hi. It's Ryan from Malaysia again. Oh, yeah. Recently, I came across an article with the headline Pierce Brosnan voted as the worst Bond actor. What? This headline made me slightly frustrated since Pierce Brosnan is my favorite James Bond. I'm Same. guessing, Ryan, you are a similar age to yeah. us because you grew up with him. Um, as per usual, these rankings will always put Sean Connery and Roger Moore in the top spot with Daniel Craig and Timothy Dalton usually placed at three and four. And somehow, George Lazenby makes it to number five. I think it's because people have really, in recent times, rated on Her Majesty's Secret Service yeah, as a great it's... Bond film. Never seen it, but I've heard it's a good one. It's good. I think it's unfair that Pierce Brosnan is getting all these negative opinions. I know that he had a great debut with Goldeneye, which was then followed by two solid entries, and they fucked it up with Die Another Day by introducing an invisible car but I would rather watch oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah they call it the vanquish I call it the vanish and then it like vanishes and then the, also the yeah. guy you know he's yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The, anyway. and then it's like um, here's the instruction manual bond if you can not James A. Castro shoot <laughs> <laughs> yes, John Cleese. John Cleese. he'd make a great cue oh my god he of course he would. he would oh my god a really good cue please don't please don't put it that pop bond <laughs> don't and then he goes, shoot through that bond, and then he gets the yeah. cannons to shoot through the manual. Uh, but yeah. God, JK James A. Caster is cute. It's gonna happen. He, he's in a similar role in Ghostbusters. Yeah, basically. Maybe face? he's too similar now. Yeah. Anyway. It's his, it's, his, it's his Bond audition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we're talking about two sort of entries. Uh, I disagree. I think Die Another Day is brilliant. But <laughs> <laughs> well, like, it, it's, a, it's a bad film that I love. Okay, sure. If we were doing film bites on me, I'd say okay, Die okay, Another yeah. Day is a bad film that I love. Uh, but I would rather watch Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough than any Sean Connery or Roger Moore Bond movies. You're doing, you're doing Piss Boss in there. A little bit, yeah. It's Marty Penny. Yeah. It's a doubt fire. I'm allergic to pepper. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart! <laughs> yeah. And then, and then Robert Williams is like, oh shit, I killed the prick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, so, so my question is, do you think these people, there was a Mrs. Doubtfire. Right? Yes. Uh, so my question is, do you think these people who answered the poll for this article vote for Connery and more because they are the OGs and hate on Brosnan because by the time he came along, they were too old to appreciate his take on the character? Also, what do you think about the rumour surrounding Aaron Taylor-Johnson being offered the role? Hope to hear your opinion soon. From Malaysia, with love. It's like from Russia, nice. with love. Yeah. Ryan, uh, P.S. I still know of people who absolutely loathe Daniel Craig's Bond. Even to post stuff on social media saying he was never James Bond and they refuse to watch his Bond films, which I think is a bit extreme. Well, I think that's crazy. I think Daniel Craig was is easily one of, one of the best Bonds. Because yeah. he was blonde. I think that was... Oh, there was a whole... Um, yeah. When he got announced, there was a website, like sort of... Um, like completely like sort of disapproving yeah. of Daniel Craig's Bond and it was a forum called Craig Not Bond. Yeah. And they would just like post hate about how Daniel Craig Ridiculous. is involved. Anyway, Daniel Craig's amazing. But George, just uh, on Piers Brosnan, on Bonds. Um, well, you know, 
as you kind of know, I have a limited, I have a ceiling of interest when we talk yeah. about Bond. I do right. find the over com- conversation about a little bit tiring. I just take on sure. a film by film basis. I love Pierce Brosnan though. Yeah, I think he's a great actor. I think he's one of the most handsome men who's ever walked the planet. Oh, I think he, he still looks looks great. great now. Looks great then. Gorgeous. So I guess his mustache sometimes oh, now. Stop it. He's like he's always getting off a plane in a stunning. Oh. jacket with a gorgeous like tom ford bag uh, terrific he looks brilliant anyway sorry uh <laughs> and i think golden i agree golden is great and i do i love tomorrow never dies very naughty is golden the world never was not enough is really silly but i remember yeah. having the video game and it was quite fun it was very yeah, it was, yeah, it also it, it, in the i have a very specific memory of it being very you know in the uk there's a whole conversation because it came out in the year 2000 it had the mm. millennium dome in it yeah it was a new bond film for a new millennium it was just really exciting and a, like it was so boat London. Scene down the, the boat scene, iconic like yeah. i really really remember all of that skiing scene yes yeah oh the, the inflatable electra electra <laughs> she's like yeah. ah, i just yeah anyway so, <laughs> so uh that and then what was the second question um, I, do, um, do, uh, oh, was it how he wrote it? Was he? Do you think people just vote Connery in more because they are the OGs I think, and they, by the time uh, I think the people Brosnan who along, feel deeply impassioned enough to vote in a poll like that are over a certain age, male, and overly protective of heritage things. So really on the political stage, probably leaning a certain way. <laughs> and they're like, Sean Connery was the best Bond. It was yeah. the best Bond, and if not, Roger Moore. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually and they probably connect with Roger Moore the least. Yeah, because he's I so... Enjoy, I enjoy the films, but I think... Oh, and I totally your, understand it's subject to the generation uh, you're born in, but Roger yeah. Moore's the more sleazy one. And, and Sean Corny. Connery. Yeah, Corny. It was, it was, it was, Sean Connery is like the iconic vision of this non-existent, roaming, travelling man who sleeps yeah. with women and is an agent. And he's more of like that sort of old-school Hollywood gentleman. But yeah, I, I think P- Pierce Brosnan was suave, but he had a bit of a yeah. bit of an edge. I live to die another day. Mm. And then <laughs> Craig was not the right. Little finger. <laughs> yeah. Santa Stark. Santa Stark lives the name's Bond. Shaking that stirred. <laughs> anyway, winter is coming. And then a Craig was like a sort of rough, roughy, and modern bulldog. Yeah. Yes, you're right. He could yeah. turn up at the at the poker game, but then he would uh, he'd be at the underground boxing match. Beating you up. Churchill with a six pack. I hope uh, our poker game isn't causing you to sweat, Mr. Bond. And then he says, I only consider myself in trouble when I start weeping blood. Uh-huh. So good. Le Chiffre is like dabbing his bloody eye. Um, Casino Royale, great film. Here is. Oh, a- sorry. Aaron Taylor Johnson as Bond. Yeah. We sort of talked about it recently. Yeah. I, think, I think he'd be great. I think he's good. I re- I don't know if it's going to happen now, though, because it's been talked about so much. And yeah, it hasn't been announced. it's sort of, uh, it's sort of all sort of been. It's they they can't do it now because everyone's sort of already adjusted yeah. to it. They want to splash. Uh, I think Aaron Taylor Johnson's great. When I saw him in Nocturnal Animals, he really graduated to like a next level performer for me. And I was like, oh my god, Aaron Taylor Johnson's great. And then mm-hmm. Bullet Train, I kind of count his, his, as his Bond audition. He's good fun in that film. But Bullet Train come and gone through me like a Bullet Train. Like a Bullet Train. Yeah, yeah I beat you to that pun. No, I mean, I, I saw you do it. I, was yeah. like, I, I, was like, I could see you were allowed to do it. As one of us, as long as one so, of us so says someone it. says it. Yeah. This next email is from Jess, who says. Great last name, Jess. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> who says, Good morning from Oz. By the way, this is a reminder that please continue, if you do write in an email, to tell us where you are writing. Oh, yeah, we from. love it. We love Some it. people don't, but I like it. We like to know. Yeah. Even, even if it's London, uh, nearby, I don't mind. Yeah. Which I know a lot of you are from London. Morning, guys. Emailing in to say a big thanks for all your great work and enthusiasm on the pod. Thank, Thank you. you. I've always had trouble with motivation, small depression energy, and decision fatigue, but your podcast has been helping me with both of these things. Nice. James, we're medicinal. That's yeah. what I like. If you went to an apothecary, they'd be like, I'll give you this little vial of pulp kitchen. We need to lobby Big Pharma. Wait, <laughs> Big Pharma usually lobbies the government, but we should lobby Big yes. Pharma so that we are sort of part of their... Can't wait for the Dope Sick series about us. <laughs> <laughs> where they were just hooked on pulp kitchen. I need more pulp. I need a bonus episode, man. <laughs> you got <laughs> Um, as soon as I wake up the podcast is on the breakfast is cooked and the day is started I love that I have to be doing something when I'm listening to something now so my house is really clean too it's literally changed my life cheers good job changed her life do you hear that James life changing that's it we can now claim to be a life changing -changing podcast I was thinking about an email you guys had quite quite a while ago Mm. currently on the back catalogue but if you ever found yourself emulating or imitating characters from films, <laughs> mine is Rachel McAdams in, uh, in Spotlight, my favorite film. Every time I'm listening nice. to someone tell me a story or say something important, I adopt that intense listening face she has and try to channel her energy. <laughs> <laughs> so, someone could be telling you about the traffic jam they're in, and you're listening to them disclose <laughs> Just, years of sexual abuse. I love how wonderfully ADHD you are. Yeah. Like running around the house and someone's saying something to you, but it's like, I'm not going to pretend to be this person. Mm. La, la, la. <laughs> I love it. 
same. I love how the camera often focuses on her listening face and not always the person talking. That's because she is the star of the movie. Yeah. She ought, she says a lot by not saying anything and letting others talk. Rachel McAdams would be my actor to choose if I had to watch only one actor's filmography forever. Oh, interesting. You got, you got Mean Girls. You got um, about time. Is that Thriller time with time Russell Crowe? Wife. Uh, well, the next. No, that's Elizabeth Banks. That's in that. Next is few it? days, yeah, could be. Um, you've got the vow with Johnny Tate. I'm not saying these are good. I'm just naming Red Cannon's movies. You've got Spotlight. Spotlight. You've got. She's done more. Stand by, stand by. Oh, Mean Girls. About time. Did you say that? Yeah. The Notebook. Yeah. Uh, Disobedience, yeah. which I didn't see. Yeah. Uh, the Hot Chick. Oh my. Uh, the Wedding Crashes. The just, wedding. Or just Wedding Crashes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Southpaw with oh, right. uh, Jake yeah. Gyllenhaal. Sherlock Holmes. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, the, the Aunt Downey Jr., Jude Law. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I probably wouldn't go for it. Uh, Doctor Strange. Yeah. My question is, um, what is your favourite journalism thriller, i.e. All the President's Men, The Post, etc.? Well, this is very relevant because of Civil War. You can actually count more as a journalism film than a war film. Much more interesting journalism film. Um, so just on that question before I move on favourite journalism thriller well uh, I've seen All the President's Men but a long time ago I, I we talked about the post recently which you said had been forgotten I no one talked so. about it. no I, I think you said no one talked about it at the time but like it def it was absolutely talked about at Meryl Street when I, I think I said no one Andrew talks Morgan. about it now yeah maybe no that's fair enough yeah, yeah six months ago but, but I actually really liked the post and other than that, other than Spotify, um, Spotlight, <laughs> spotlights and Spot Civil, War, Civil War, other journalism. Yeah, thrillers. I mean, like recently, I think Civil War is a war journalism film, despite mm. you know, not really taking, uh, not really going for the war thing. Yeah. It asks a lot of questions that are very underexplored in film mm. in terms of war photography. In terms of yeah, what it means to capture a war. Has there been any good sort of films recently where it's like an expose? Someone, I that journalist. Like Spotlight Dark Waters. Which oh, a lot of people no, like. that wasn't journalism. No. And, I, and you would know yeah, if you'd seen it. Seen it yeah. <laughs> That's a legal thriller. Yeah, legal thriller. Um, okay. Controversial movie opinion. I love Mockingjay Part 1. Okay. I know it's dry, but I love the dialogue. Katniss looks wrecked. It's no one has ever said that about that movie. Katniss looks wrecked. It's political tension. It's James Newton Howard. It's ha Woody Harrelson in a beanie. Love. Also, how is it that no one ever mentions how dumb it is that Catching Fire, the picture of Katniss's family and the locket given to her by Peter, are stock images from the first film? They've Googled their own so movie lazy. and cut out something from Getty Images. I laugh every time, even though it's a beautiful scene. Have a great one. Jess from Toowoomba, Australia. 10 points if you can pronounce Toowoomba correctly. I've probably not pronounced it correctly, but there you go. I also noticed that in Amy, uh, sorry, in Back to Black, where uh, they she looks at a picture of her and her nan, and it's basically a picture that was taken of her and her nan in a scene earlier in the film. Oh, that was, so like, 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 and I'm like, it's Just a get image. a picture of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get a picture. Yeah. Add it to the call sheet on one of the days that they're working together. Guys, just need a picture. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I saw Catching Fire Part 1 in cinema. And was Mocking so, Joe Part One. Mo sorry, Mocking Joe Part One. And I was really bored by it. It was very grey, very miserable. Um, I don't I don't agree. And then I try I started part two later, just watching it on my laptop <laughs> year after it had come mm. out, and I got so bored I stopped watching. Hunger Games, they've now entered that realm of franchises like Terminator and Alien, <sighs> where they've made more Fewer, bad. Yeah, more bad than they did good. Which unfortunately, unfortunately, that is most franchises, but um, oh, that's true. Yeah. the ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is is truly one of the worst reviews I've given on the show. It was. It really was terrible. Thank Sorry. you for that email, Jess. Uh, this next one is from Zar. Zar writes in and says, Hi, George and James. Uh, the, 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 the subject title, Colour Balance. Okay. During your episode about Ripley, you referred to the colours in the talented Mr. Film being gorgeous to look at. Yes. With the uh, check out our Ripley review from last week. Uh, with the colour of the Campari being jewel-like ruby red and the sea aqua blue. Mm. This made me wonder how much difference the colour balance or quality of a screen makes to how we see and respond to films. Of a screen? Of a screen. Okay. I'm pretty sure my TV really turns up the saturation. For example, do cinemas take care over color calibrating their screens and are some better at it than others? Thanks so much for the show, which I often do listen to in the kitchen. Zah, don't even get me started on screens, colors, 
But please do get all started. Sorts. I will briefly get started on it. So with uh, with TVs, they all or every every company interprets color in a different way. It's like a color science, and there are different screen technologies that represent color in different ways. And you also have to be aware that less so now, but when people go to buy a television, they are in the like Best Buy John Lewis with all of the TVs lined up next to each other, mostly showing the exact same piece of content. So all of they need to make sure that their TV is the brighter, most saturated, most contrasted with the deepest blacks and the brightest colors when literally held up to someone else's. So for a very long time, less so now, because people buy don't buy TVs as much in store. They read reviews and then order it online. You're literally trying to be the brightest, best, most colorful mm. screen, which obviously the thing that's the most colorful isn't the, mo the best, most accurate or best to look yeah. at. So that's that's going away a bit, especially as like TVs have become very standardized and the technology's really settled into itself. That could be annoying because uh, TVs will uh, have these vivid picture profiles which really boost the color on everything. And it can be quite distracting if you're watching a film and you start seeing banding on a compressed image where like bits of cheeks are different, are like yeah, too the, saturated you see the makeup, orange. You? Yeah. you see the makeup and um, th there's all sorts of annoying pro-motion stuff where the the motion has been changed when like motion in cinema is really oh, yeah. important. When it comes to color grading, like I'm not a professional color grader, but I do color grade as part of my job. It winds me up so much that screens are the same. This is like a four and a half grand MacBook Pro. And I think the screen on it for color accuracy is okay. When you put that on a monitor and you compare the color with what you had on there with on this, I'm like, well, what color was it in the first place now? I don't yeah. know. I actually find the most accurate way to check color, the most consistent screen, is my pro iPhone. Hmm. Like a, a, a decent iPhone, it tends to be the most consistent huh. color screen, whereas this one isn't always. And the only way to get out of it is to spend about five to 15,000 pounds on a proper reference monitor, which obviously, unless you're a flame op, you're not going to do that. Wow. So it's really frustrating. And every screen has got different things going on. They have different functions. It, it's very annoying. Yeah. But in terms of cinemas, um, I'm sure cinemas, most cinemas should be very well calibrated, but um, some of them are shit. When we watch, uh, and the TV at my parents' house has a good setting where it does give things a nice, gentle boost on the contrast, boost yeah, on like the colours, vivid. which is nice, a nice yeah. vivid, yeah, which is yeah. great. However, if you leave it on and forget to turn it off, you then go and watch a football match, and the green of the pitch yeah. is like... That's ah. there to sell the TV in the I shop. Know. It's, it's It is nice, it's nice to look at. But for example, if I export our podcast on this screen and play it, it looks close to how I had, or on my phone, it looks close yeah. to how it looked in Premiere Pro. But when I put it on that TV, everything's brighter, more punchy, more contrasty. So you just you just end up going mad if you actually try and focus on, well, what color was it in the first place? It's like, yeah. And then you think about a client going to watch a video and then I'm like, well, what are they gonna watch it on? And who yeah. are the people who are gonna receive this video gonna watch it on? If a color falls in a forest and no one's around to see it on the right monitor, does that does have it? a color? Exactly. So yeah, I don't really have an answer more that I just, it pisses me off too. This next email is from John who says, hi, George and James, James and George. First off, love the podcast. One of your recent episodes covered Band of Brothers and it reminded me of another incredible HBO miniseries and that is the far less remembered 2008 John Adams starring Paul Giamatti. This, rem this reminder set me off beginning to what set me off to begin rewatching it, and it's not only as great in quality as I recalled, but it's also chock full of familiar faces, all performing at the top of their game. Just to call out a few: Laura Linney, Andrew Scott, nice. Danny Houston, Tom Wilkinson, R.A.P., still Stephen Delane, Ebon Moss, Backrack, Sarah Polly, Rufus Sewell, Justin Theroux, David Morse, and Tom Hollander. The last two are particular standouts, Morse as the strongly stoic yet softly spoken George Washington and Hollander as a simmering King George III. You know what, I can so see Tom mm. Hollander playing King George III. Yeah, totally. sort of, oh, pathetic. I've lost the Americans. Love it. <laughs> In a single scene performance that can't be looked away from. Anyway, what I find most interesting about the show is its choice to portray the founding fathers of America as well as everyone else in the series as unglamorously as possible. This is also directed, this series, I believe, by Tom Hooper, who would oh, then yeah. go on to do, you know, King's Speech, et cetera. Cats. Yes. Um, as, un, uh, yeah, as unglamorously as possible. Bad skin, itchy wigs, and truly horrendous dental hygiene, as was common in the 18th and 19th centuries, all for the purpose of bringing these historical figures, commonly held in the highest regard in America, down to a level where we, the audience, can see them as real people and then better understand them. Very good observation. Mm. 
Watching this series, again, has also crystallized a thought I couldn't quite grasp this last Oscar season. Why I loved Paul Giamatti's performance in The Holdovers, but wasn't surprised by it. It's because I'd already seen him in complete control of every scene as John Adams, a complicated, brash, highly opinionated loudmouth who was nonetheless a good man and a patriot to his core. In my mind, this series let Giamatti show off the absolute best of his talents as an actor. I highly recommend everyone to watch it, especially as it's an election year in America. Good to remind ourselves ourselves of what actual love of country should look like mm. uh, take care jo- john from pasadena california i imagine hearing the sort of the the national anthem the, yeah the flag flying behind the, me. Fi- the flag at like 50 percent of pasadena yeah <laughs> do you know what john um, an eagle just soaring <laughs> that's that's a good recommendation because it's a limited series yeah. it's a mini series i think i would watch that knowing the talent involved yeah and knowing that it's still Fancy rated it. highly also you know as we've discussed before i'm a bit of a history Fan history, dad. As How's you say. the Polish history book? Coming? Oh, I had to retire it, retire it, but slash put it on a sabbatical because <laughs> it was. I feel like I've read volume one. Yeah, I read. Are you gonna pick it up on holiday, maybe, or do you think you want oh, something more? I think I'm gonna pick it up when my itch to read more about that period of history on your 65th again. birthday. <laughs> Perhaps I, I've read 300 and something pages, and it's 500 well pages, but it gets you know it's bogged down. Yeah, I love. Do you it. sort of read for a page, and you're like, I didn't really pick any of that up. I'll have to start that page. Yeah, again. and yeah. if you lose momentum, I mean, it really goes in. Like, it, it, yeah. it, I'm in a particularly dry chapter about like the diplomacy of the Polish government in exile in the yeah. Second World War, and I'm yeah. like, it is interesting, but I've I run out of momentum. You know, that's like when you've had too much chicken, you've been chewing on the chicken for so long, your mouth's gone dry, you can't actually break it down anymore yeah and i'm like i need to retire this for a second yeah but random tangent but yes great book on public history this next one is from charlie who writes in uh says hi james and george i'm just writing to you after your review of civil war and ripley and the f- please go and check out those reviews if you haven't already the first of which you talked about wagner mora's performance and how you love seeing him in things he yes. was excellent recently in a few episodes of donald glover's series mr and mrs smith he's the mm. guy who played um you watched it no, no, sorry. Uh, Wagner Mora played... Wagner Mora was in Civil War and played uh, Pablo Escobar. Why, why is that name completely gone from yeah, Pablo Escobar. Um, I've loved Glover's career so far and find him a really interesting voice in media recently, especially with Atlanta, which is fantastic. I do recommend his new show. Although there was a big push for it a few weeks ago, it seems to have been overlooked compared to the other movie-based TV show with only a vague connection to the original, Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman. So oh, he's yeah. playing Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And Guy, Guy Ritchie's the Gentleman. Uh, whereas Glover created an interesting meditation on relationships, inferiority, and race, Ritchie has absolutely nothing to say mr Mm. and mrs smith the movie was an enjoyable romp that in my eyes is about an equal in fun and engagement to the original richie film but even that fun is sucked out in richie's new series i'm so disappointed that it's so high in the netflix charts as i think it may be one of his worst projects of which there aren't actually that many highs for me Mm. every character talks in the same way every scene has the same energy there's no emotion from any of the actors and it does definitely feel like the second screen viewing as you two coined it's such uh, we didn't didn't coin it's such a shame that netflix to put this out on the same week as ripley as it does just show me that they're going to stick to pumping out this schlack. Is Mr. and Mrs. Smith perfect? By no means, but it has at least a reason for its existence. Anyway, if you checked either of these out, I'd be glad to hear your thoughts. Hope you're well. Regular punter Charlie from Edinburgh. Oh, friend of the show. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, uh, uh, sorry, um, what's face? The, the gentleman has done extraordinarily well. Yes. Anecdotally, I've heard a lot of people say to me, oh, have you, got, have you seen the gentleman? It's fantastic. You've got to watch it. And then similarly, I've read reviews that say it doesn't really get to have much to say and isn't really that interesting. I think so. it's why you watch it. I, I know a couple of people have watched it and they're like, yeah, it's like fun, watchable, throw it on. But like, yeah. it's not deep. If It's not prestige drama. It's a good elevator pitch. Rich people growing, uh, yeah. selling drugs in their in huge estates. Yeah. Mm. Um, Excess. Oh, mis- crime. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Smith is on Prime if people wanted yeah. to watch that and The Gentleman is on Netflix, which didn't come out at the same time as Ripley. That's not quite true. It came out a month before. Mm. It's like they Netflix's releases this year were like, one day, boom, the gentleman, boom, three body problem, boom, not got done quite as well as no, not as well. It's a uh, nice expensive Ripley. series, three body problem, wasn't it? No, really, really expensive. Yeah. Um, and it, I this. do think um, I'm really noticing TV shows that are not hitting that mm. otherwise maybe a decade ago would have had a really big splash and run in are just lost with the next piece of content. Yeah. It's like a TikTok feed where like you just need yes. more churn. Yeah. And if you're lucky, like one does brilliantly. Yeah. But sometimes it just it's just a, like like um the uh 
what's it called? The Band of Brothers remake, oh, Masters, Masters of the, the Air. Air. Like in another in another decade, that would have been a huge event series that loads of people would have talked about. But I just don't think it's. It's not up. even in the. It's probably like eighth biggest show. It's like the eighth most talked about show now. And I, I worry I think that eighth would be kind, considering I've not really heard anyone mention it. And I kind of think because I, I haven't. I'm going to watch Fallout. I haven't started it yet, but that mm. like, like looks huge and looks big, and the reviews are quite promising. But in a way, they've like dumped all the episodes at once and you can't on Prime. Should it have come out? Yeah, weekly? and I'm like, I think you've got you've kind of shot yourselves in the foot there. That's mm. going to make it even more um, intan- um, insubstantial, like transient. Different shows, I think, should be binged and be yes. available. And other shows, I'm like, no, you should you should let people have a conversation every week. Yeah. For two months. Totally. Three months. Because that's how you build a community and build a following. Yeah. But instead of just sort of... Because then it's just there. There's no incentive to catch up or watch it in time. Like the great TV shows, like, you know, Breaking Bad mm. and um, Game of Thrones did so well because people talked it's all people talked about yeah. for three months when it was on yeah. oh my god Sunday night I've got to watch Game of Thrones yeah totally yeah. anyway uh, this next email is from Benjamin who says introductory scary films hello guys hope you're both well I'm wondering if either of you have some recommendations mm. for scary films that might ease me into the genre and get me mentally prepared to watch a film like Hereditary I'd love to watch films like Hereditary okay. but always too concerned that they will leave me frightened for weeks please don't say just watch it you'll be fine many thanks Benji no no it's true you, you can't just watch it and it's disturbing as well yeah it's it's you need to build up to it I think a good entry level if I may James mm. entry level scary film is Scream yeah Scream's great because it's fun Teeny. it's funny but it's kind of creepy but it's not like horror horror of like supernatural it's yeah. just kind of threatening and but it, it totally ticks that box of being scared yes. in a film. Yeah. And I always divert people to M. Night Shyamalan's films like Signs, The mm. Village, and The Sixth Sense. Those mm. have like scary moments in yes. them, but they're also decent. His early work, I think those are decent films that have good scares. Yeah. Uh, and then I'd say A Quiet Place is a modern one that's actually yes. quite good for a modern scare. Good entry level. Get Out Us. Yeah. Get, get Out maybe a bit scary for you. Again, I don't know what your... Mm thing and then if you want to go old school you could check out psycho it's scary but yeah. i think very doable i watched it very young and i lived to tell the tale yeah um john carpenter's halloween yeah there's a great, great that's like a classic teen slasher that has a really scary concept and there's good jump scares in it it mm. follows similarly i agree yeah those are good ones to to go with but like i, I think like i watched m night Shyamalan, m night Shyamalan scary films were the first ones that i would have watched that would have been scary mm. it's like signs mm. I sent you the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah. That scene is really good. The found footage scene before found footage was cool in yeah. signs of the the band Joaquin Phoenix watching it in the cupboard. It's also funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. scary and funny. And the alien. The... Oh, uh, uh, an American Werewolf in London's really good. Have you seen that? No. Oh, not. it's good fun and and has punchy scares in it yeah. and like really gnarly sp- practical effects. Yeah, but it's funny as well. There are lots out there. Us, us as well creepy yeah us is uh, did we say it follows sorry did yeah, we say yeah, that's yeah a good oh the passing. witch i think the witch is actually pretty yeah because i'd say there are three great scares in it and then the rest of it's fairly like humdrum life it's almost like it's not scarier than the other ones i mentioned but the witch is more unsettling oh yeah okay fair yeah it's like it's really disturbing and uh, creepy mm. like the goat mm. <laughs> oh yeah yeah and like this image of the baby being gone, and I tell you, Joy, like, oh, yeah, the yeah, thing, yeah, and then you just yeah. see the, the witch running into the woods. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you even see her? I think you just hear the twigs, like, snapping. I think that's one moment you see just her run. Just the edge just of a frame. The edge of uh. a, it running into the woods, and then later in the woods. Uh. I know. There, it's I a, forgot about there's that. There's like film. two, it's two, like, one, two punch of two scares right at the beginning of the witch. Similarly, the really lighthouse good. is scary ish, yeah. but really unsettling. Yeah. It's like a nightmare. Also, quite funny, though, the lighthouse. Yeah. I thought it was just kind of wild. If you're afraid of being scared versus afraid of being just like unsettled and mm. creeped, they're, di- yeah. they're different things in my head. Whereas, whereas Halloween isn't unsettling, it's mm. scary. Yeah. Well, it's quite tame now, but it's just moved yeah. on. Anyway. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, as, as always, guys, if you want to send in your emails, send your thoughts in to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com and we read them out of the show. Let's play a game. James, yeah, I have two new rounds of, of a game, of two new games for you to play, okay? Two rounds so, of two games. I have two new games, yeah. okay? One round, round of each. each. Okay. Yeah. And they're hard. Okay. I'm going to give you... Four hours. <laughs> I'm going to give you a minute for each one. Okay. Okay. This is about architecture. No, 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 no. James, I'm going to ask you mm. to name a film that came out in the years 2024 backwards. Oh, okay. So I want you to name me a film that came out in 2024 
then okay. 2023, then 22, and get as far as you can oh, in a God. minute. Okay. okay. All right. How do I introduce this? Um, okay. I'm just going to go. I'm going to do it year by year. I'm going to announce you year by year. Okay. Ready? You? No, I'm not ready. You have one minute to name a movie that came out in 2024. Uh, okay. June part two. 2023. Uh, 2023, a film that came out last year would be um, The Holdovers. No, that's this year. Well, last year for America, I'll allow it. 2022. Uh, Top Gun Maverick. 2021. Okay, A Men. No, that's 2022. Top Gun Maverick was 2022. Yeah. 2021, we'll go with... um, Oh my God, this is is such a you game. (laughs) 2021. um, uh, No Time to Die. Right, 2020. Tenet. 2019. Um, uh, the, um, <sighs> you've mentioned one already today. Let's go, uh, Bald the Irishman. Irishman. Sure. Uh, 2018 for four Blade seconds. Runner 2049. Uh, no, it's 2017 and Shit. you're out. So you got five years, five years done that. That's a hard one. I know it's oh, hard. I get one from 2022. No, you got 22, all right. It was 21 you struggled at because it's that sort of weird COVID era. Oh, yeah. era. It's hard, right? That's, that is hard. I Do like you, it, though. I we, like it, though. I, I know. I'm sorry. Well, you know, we've got to, got to freshen up a little bit, give it a little bit of a change. Name more 2018 films. Na- name more? Yeah. Well, I just did a couple. Yeah. You want some more? I'll give you some more. I completely don't remember. Uh, Thunder Road. Uh, when did Us come out? 2018. No, the 2019. That was 2019. No, not 2019. 2018 was Halloween, the new Halloween with Jamie Lee Curtis. It's not how my brain has organized. I, my brain hasn't organized things by date first. It's like if you, I can, na- I can name films and then be like, oh yeah, from 2018, maybe. I, I that's you, why you're, you're organized by date. I know. It's like, I, I was like, I knew yeah. I can do this. Your shelf is like, yeah. You do start with date and yeah. then you categorize. Anyway, that Very was one okay, to cool. get your mind. And I'm just gonna get my timer ready for the second game. I'm going to ask you to name a film for every letter of the alphabet oh, okay. in one minute. Okay, oh, ready? Okay. All right. In one minute, name a movie for every letter of the alphabet. Go. Okay, Anchorman. Yes. B movie. Sure. Cars. Yep. Driving Miss Daisy. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Evil Dead. Sure. Um, um, F, uh, Frank. Uh, G, uh, uh, Get Out. Yep. Uh, H, um, H, Harry Potter. Yep. Uh, I, right. uh, uh, um, yeah. H, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, um, <laughs> I, Robot. Yeah. <laughs> um, J, uh, Jackie, uh, K, uh, are we done? Yeah, you're doing good, keep going. K, uh, uh, Kill Bill, yep. uh, L, uh, uh, <laughs> Lincoln, yes. uh, M, Mother, yep. N, um, uh, uh, no, no Time to Die, yes. <laughs> um, O, um, um, <laughs> I'm routing. O would be, Oh Brother, Art Thou? Yes. And then, oh, uh, P. Oh, tie, well Ooh. done though. You got to O. Would you like oh. to keep going? Would you like to get to the end? If I gave you another minute, would you like to get to the end? <laughs> we can do it, it's really hard. Uh, oh, what James. comes after O? P. P, uh, uh, P, uh, P would be, um... <laughs> that's really hard. P would be, uh, uh, P. P, P. <laughs> P would be uh, p- p- poor, poor things. Right. <laughs> uh, Q, we're now. Uh, um, Think of Helen Mirren. The Queen? Yes. Oh, those, yeah. Okay, Q, U. You. Um, you. Jordan, Jordan Peele. Us. Mm-hmm. And then after U is V, V for Vendetta. And then we got W, Wicker Man. And we got X, Mac and, oh no, X, uh, X, X, no, yes, yes, yeah, X, Y, um, uh, come on, <laughs> come on, 10 seconds, come no, on, no, do you want the pressure? Y would be yes, man, yes, and Z would be Zulu. Yes, you did it! <laughs> That's so stressful. Uh, first of all, well done on getting as far as you did. I'm happy with those. That is, that is also what I loved is that you were pulling films that I don't think you we haven't even mentioned yeah, before. We, you've never seen some of those films, but also you've just like, you're pulling them out of nowhere. I love it. 
I, 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 robot. Like Frank, the 2012 <laughs> I've movie. I've seen Frank. Yeah, I like, like We haven't talked, yeah, we haven't talked about that film in ages. Yeah. Wow. Good, good, what good on you. What did I put the T? You said, uh, did you say train spotting maybe or Terminator? No. Did we do S? I think I missed some letters. I didn't do S or T. Are you sure? I'm sure if I went back. I'm sure yeah, if we get okay. back, we'll find All right, it. Yeah. But anyway, James, that's it. That's, that's the it. hardest what brain workout yeah. you've had on a game. But good, I like it. That's, uh, that was fun. That was the games this week. And James, you, I put you through it. We wanted to do something different. No, 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 we I've should done do it. numbers. Oh, I think we How have high done. you can done. How high you can go with numbers. Do it for me. All right, George, ready? Yeah, go on, time me. You've got a name uh, film. Hey Siri, start a one minute timer. Name a film with the letter one. Uh, one day. Name a film with the letter two. Two days. Uh, two two brothers. One. Two brothers. Yeah, sure. Uh, three. Three. Ten to Yuma. Yeah. <laughs> Four. Four weddings and a funeral. Yes. Five. Five nights at Freddy's. Yes. Six. Six uh, nights. The... Could just do six as well. Yeah, six. Uh, seven. Seven, the movie Seven. Yeah, eight. Uh, eight and a, a half. Technically, it's in the title. Eight and a half. Eight, 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 eight legged freaks. Eight, uh, eight, yeah. eight, yeah. Nine. Nine, the movie nine. Yeah, ten. Ten, ten things I hate about you. Yes, eleven. Eleven. Uh, uh, Ocean's eleven. Yes, twelve. Ocean's twelve. <laughs> Thirteen. Ocean's 13. <laughs> Fourteen. Uh, Fourteen. Oh, Ooh, are there fourteen? I don't think there is a fourteen. This is getting tricky now, of teens. Fourteen. Mm. Mm. 15 15 time I could, yeah, have, it's a I could have said 13 going on 30 as well yes true um, yeah. you, you went to 3 and you said 3 at that billboards outside of Missouri but you went for 310 to Yuma another film we've never mentioned on the show yeah. in two and a half years <laughs> exactly your yeah. brain just pulls it from a completely yeah. different file yeah oh, uh, wow. yeah the te- teens are probably harder 17 again is coming up yes. 16 you could have 16 could have candles done. 18, it's tricky, 18, it's 18 rated films. 19. Edge of 17. Yeah. So, uh, 19, 8, 19, 17. Yeah, I'll give it 19 as well. You 20, 2012. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Very good. 21 Jump Street, 22 yeah, two Jump, Jump Street, Street, 23... The number 23 with Jim Carrey. Oh, well done. Yeah. <laughs> 24. 24. There's a film. There's a 24 film, isn't there? There must be. 24. Did they make a oh, film yes, with 20, 24? 20, yes, they, 24. Oh, they did. Like 24 Legacy or 24. Oh, cool. yeah. There was a 24 yeah. movie. 25. 25. There must be some sort of Christmas film, like 25. The 25th. 26. 27 Dresses. Yeah. 28 Days Later. Yeah. 29. I mean, it's getting niche now. I know. The 30. 30 going on 30. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, you probably get the decade. You probably get the rounds of 10. 12 years a slave, 12 years, 12 angry men as well. Yeah. <sighs> right, guys, those are the games. Thank you so much for playing along. Let us know if you managed to. It's a good, that's a great car game. Yes. If like a driving, lot of our games. Continue to do that. You've got a big road trip planned. Mm. Sc- scratch down a bunch of our games. So I think that'd be great for a, for a busy car kids, a film buffs. <laughs> We should, we should put one of those as like a round for an upcoming quiz, like a sudden death. Mm, yes. Like you pull a number out of a bag. Hopefully we'll do another quiz soon. Stay tuned. Thank you for joining us for episode 124. Um, we'll, don't forget, we'll be doing a bonus episode this week. We'll be talking in depth in spoilers about Civil War. And we'll also yeah. be talking about the Joker 2 trailer. Um, Folia de. James, would you like to... Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you've made it here, we really appreciate you. You're our biggest fans. Don't forget, we post yeah. new episodes of this show every single Wednesday with extra episodes out later in the week. We also post loads of stuff on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. Many, many of you discovered the show that way, but if you don't follow us or you just continue to do so and film recommend bites, us that way... Film coming out. Film bites. I went very Beth Rigby on a recent film bites. You did. What film? Which director is underrated? You're really giving them the hard questions. Yeah. You Whereas do the you, full packs, man. You, do the, uh, you, do, you bend your legs. You go... What's the best film you've seen in 2024? Yeah. Do like a CBBC. Disney Channel yeah. thing. Hey! Hey. Hey, kids. So I'm like, what film is overrated? <laughs> I'm Beth Rigby. Hey. Hi. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Let's go. Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up, guys. Uh, see you, you next week. See you next week. Look out for the bonus. Sirens on our end. Fairly well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.